Good morning, Mount Zion Church. Let's stand to our feet. We finish a season of Thanksgiving and we prepare our hearts for next week when Advent begins officially. And we thank you, God, that in this time we can reenact in our calendar year the, the events of the incarnation, the events of redemption. We want to take one final week to prepare our hearts to be abundantly thankful. Meet with us today. We ask you, dear God. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's enjoy his presence.
Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. We've come together once again to stand in this place with the people we will spend forever with. Take two minutes. Find somebody you don't know. Greet one another with the love of the Lord. See people you do know. Ask them about Thanksgiving.
Good morning, good morning. How are we doing? All right, you may be seated. We are about to take my favorite meal. We are about to take my favorite meal in, in communion. Here's my prayer is that we are very, very, very intentional about this meal right now. That we focus on Jesus in this meal right now. And so the typical Passover, right, it would have a lamb. Now this Passover with Jesus and his disciples, they didn't have a lamb on the table. The lamb of God was at the table. And so when we go into scripture in Mark 14, 22 through 24, it said, as they were eating, he took bread. And after blessing it, broke it. And he gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when, he gave, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And all of them drank. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. So when we eat of this bread, we rem- we're reminded that it is the body that was broken for you and I. When we drink that cup, we're reminded that is the blood of Jesus that was poured out that was to completely cover our sins. I think we can all agree here that we're the ones that deserve the judgment. We're the ones at one point in time rejected God, but yet Jesus said, I love you this much that I'm going to pay your cost. So during this next song, Can we be intentional? Can we understand that when we eat that, it's not just a wafer, it's not just juice. When we break that bread, when we drink that juice, that's the body and the blood that stood in your place so that you may have eternal life. So when we go into this song, let's thank him. Let's be with him because we're about to break bread with the Father.
Son, sacrifice his body for us. Lord, you are so good. Lord, you are so good. And there's nothing that compares to your glory. In your holy name, amen. All right, you may be seated. So we're about to have uh, an amazing piece from our mind troupe, Silent Witness. Good morning. Morning. Have you ever felt like you're maybe two different people? There's two parts of you warring inside of you? <laughs> amen. No, I'll amen that. Amen. <clears throat> so one part wants to do God's will. One part wants to bear up and be strong under uh, what he's given you to deal with. And the other part, quite frankly, is scared to death and doesn't want to do it and, and just wants to run away from it all or hide. That's exactly, I believe, how the Virgin Mary felt when she was bearing God's son. All the private and public ridicule she, I'm sure, had to endure. Um, quite frankly, the possible stoning <laughs> or a suspected adultery. So many things. And yet she still cried out to God. He was her strength, he was her shield, he was her help. So I want to encourage each and every one of you this morning, whatever you find yourself in, especially if there's that war going on inside of you, cry out to the breath of heaven, and he will meet you there. He will give you peace.
Amen. Amen. Woo. Well, that's all we need to hear. Let's know. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, let's pray. Father God, we just uh, thank you, Lord, uh, for living within us, Holy Spirit, that we can walk in the ways that you have directed us, Lord. We can have the strength when we don't feel like we have it. Lord, you are within us, and so we just thank you for your great love, your great truth, your great mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Good morning, Mount Zion. It's good to be here with you, and uh, who did some traveling during the last week? Anyone, did, anyone get stuck at an airport? Anybody? I did, but uh, that was no fun. <laughs> But um, it is good to be here with all of you and um, to worship our Lord. And what an encouragement. I was just talking with someone in the lobby. What an encouragement it is, the body of Christ, um, to be with one another, to give glory where glory is due in these, in these songs and um, the, the silent witness uh, presentation here, the word as it's coming shortly here. What a blessing. And then... Out there in the lobby, there are tangible ways for us to uh, live out our faith. Um, there is this green flyer, and I'm not going to go over all of it, but there are two sides. One side has um, all the various things going on in the month of December, the calendar. Um, and then the other side, there are ways to give. And out in the lobby, there's a, a couple things set up. So we have our Hannah's Hope tree out there, and you can grab a little... Um, uh, a ticket off of the tree to to bless someone that is in need. Uh, so they can give you information. There were uh, two folks out there uh, before you came in, and they'll be out there as well after the service if you want some more information um, to, to how you can bless um, these. And, and Hannah's Hope is our anti-human trafficking ministry here. And so... They, there's, this is a very large team that is on Hannah's Hope, and they um, bless so many. And so this is one, they do this every, every Christmas. So be sure to check out that tree. And then also uh, we have uh, uh, stockings that we are collecting. I think we're almost done. I think there's only a few stockings left. This is for our food pantry ministry. So we deliver food to folks, and then our kids' ministry has put these stockings together to bless um, the, the folks that we deliver food to as well. Um, and then we have our, our cookbooks as well that are, um, those funds are going towards our mission uh, board. So lots of, and then there's other ways as well on here to give. So check out um, this flyer. Hey, at the end of this service, during the last song, we are having baptisms all of this uh, the Sunday, at the three services now at the 11 and at 6 o'clock. And so uh, the Lord says to be baptized. And so this is a gift from our Lord. So maybe you have not been baptized. And during the last song, we'll be over there. And if you want to be baptized, if you feel the Lord tugging on your heart, you didn't have to sign up in advance for this, uh, a lot of times people just respond to what the Lord is calling them to do. Um, so be in prayer. We'll ask you two questions in that baptismal pool. We'll ask you, have you turned from your sin? Have you repented from sin? And then the other question, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And so um, be in prayer. Uh, maybe you've already been baptized, but be in prayer for those who are making that decision to be baptized uh, today. Uh, so why don't we uh, pray for uh, the word as it's coming here and pray for the announcements that we've just shared. Father God, we thank you so much for all the opportunities we have here, Lord, to grow in our faith, to, to learn more about your word. So many uh, Bible studies and groups and connecting groups and so many ways that we can grow, Lord, so many ways that we can um, get wisdom from uh, fellow believers here. And God, we just thank you for all those opportunities. We thank you, Lord, for all the ways to give as we're in this holiday season now. And Lord, you have given us uh, your son 
And so, God, we are uh, so blessed uh, to be able to, to know you, God, that we can know you, the, the king of this universe. Uh, what a privilege that is, Lord, and that we can now come here and go to your word. Lord, you have given us uh, your holy scriptures, and I pray as my brother uh, shares with us, you would speak through him that, Lord, the truth and the love in your word would just speak to our hearts and that you would be our teacher, Lord. You would show us how to be more like you. And Lord, we just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. And thank God for scripture, because if it wasn't for scripture, we'd be going based on my opinion. That might be a problem. That's probably one of my favorite things about uh, about preaches. I, I get to use the Bible. All right. Nice TV, isn't it? That's cool. All right, so. So let's do a quick rundown. Week one. Week one was the spirit of thanklessness. In thanklessness, we see selfishness, we see indifferent, and we see neglect. In week two, we saw thankfulness. And I think we're all starting to recognize that thankfulness, this is a choice. This is a choice that you have in order to understand and experience all of God's grace and all of his presence. So now we come into week three, the generous heart, generous heart. So we we just got done Thanksgiving. I personally love Thanksgiving. Uh, One of the reasons because when you become adult, you actually have to start buying more presents, right? Now on Thanksgiving, you don't have to buy as many presents, right? That's wonderful. Now the other thing that I love about it is the, the time with family. Not to mention, when I pull up to the, to the table, there's zero judgments. We all know what we're about to do to this food, right? So we love the food piece and, uh, and, and football, you know? And this is one of the days I think as my kids grow, they're going to love because they're going to realize they could probably get away with anything because after dinner, I'm not getting up off that couch, right? So, uh, but Thanksgiving is just, it's so, it's so beautiful. So here's what I want to do first. As we get into the message, one of the most important things to do is invite the Holy Spirit in. All right, so I'm going to do a quick prayer, and then we're going to get into it. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your glory. Thank you, Lord, that that you love us through it all. Thank you that we have the opportunity to be thankful in all that you give. So, Father, bless these words because these words are from your gospel. And Lord, we are thankful for that. I pray that you are opening the hearts, opening the ears, opening the minds, and that the Holy Spirit is speaking to everyone here today. Thank you, Lord, for the free gift of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we give you praise and we give you glory in your holy name. Amen. So Thanksgiving, this is that beautiful reminder to be thankful. I was actually reminded of this a little bit as I had a conversation when someone uh, was talking to me and they said, Hey, how come miracles don't happen like they did in the Bible? How come they don't happen now? I was like, well, what's your, but that's perspective based because to be honest, when I walk outside that door and I feel breath in my lungs, I feel the breeze on my face, I see the sunshine raising, I hear the birds singing, man, that's a miracle. Life is a miracle. The way you think, the way you talk, it is a miracle. And so there's so many things to be thankful for. So now my question becomes, when Thanksgiving comes, is it just something that we're saying out of routine now? When we're taking that time and someone asks you the beautiful question, what are you thankful for? Is it just another answer? Or is it something that is deep within your soul, within your spirit, that produces generosity. My take is true generosity only comes from the lens of Christ. True generosity. Because the fact is, when we accept Jesus, he comes into our hearts 
and he starts to clean out the messes that we have made our whole life. Because he sees who we can become. So when we look at it from that standpoint, generosity, it is not from our strength. It is from the power of God. And so I want to make a quick introduction to Zerubbabel. Okay, Zerubbabel, which was in the Old Testament, he was a civic leader. And he had this daunting task of rebuilding the temple. And so at this very moment, he's discouraged because the project is stalled. So he needed a word. So we, we see that word in Zechariah 4.6. It said, then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. As people, we have limits. Our strength has limits. Our power has limits. And Lord knows our patience has limits. But when he says, but by my spirit, there is no limitation there. There's zero limitation because that resource that he's talking about is available to you 24-7. And so we're going to begin with digging into the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, this is something that I encourage you to walk through all the time. Because what we see there is David being real and authentic. I love Psalms because it doesn't make me feel as crazy. David goes through the ups and the downs. And he has this struggle between his his hurts. But he also is able to show his faithfulness through it all. And so before we define generosity, we're going to do something that most of us don't like to do. Well, we got to peer, peel back this. Because we got to understand where is generosity coming from? What is it generating from? So we're going to go to Psalms 13, 1 through 4. Here's what I'm going to ask. I ask that you read it along with me. Because as you're reading it, you're going to feel something. You're going to feel David. So let's start with verse 1. Read with me. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice, because I am shaken. What emotions is running through this man's head right now? There's tension. There's desperation. There's fear. Because as, as, as we're going through this, David's trying to make sense of the situation that he's in. The times of running away, the times of being told that he's going to be killed. He's trying to make sense of the situation. When scripture repeats something, it's pretty important. And he says, how long? Four times. As he says those words, I think in my life, I'm sure you think in your life, I remember those how long moments to where I'm pleading with the Lord, Lord, I'm I'm trying to trust you, but how long is this going to last? Is there an end point? How long is this going to last? And our how longs may not be the same as David, but guess what? We still have the same angst. We still have the same tension that is building up inside of us. And our personal feelings become so intense, we start to create our own reality. The reality of of, of David saying, Lord, have you turned away from me? Where are you? I know I've worshipped you time and time again, so I'm wondering, where are you at? I think this is a verse that, that brought up some feelings for me, because several weeks ago, 
I'm in my truck and I'm driving to, to church. All of a sudden, tears just start running by down my face. And in that moment, I felt so inadequate. I felt so inadequate. My job is supposed to be generous. That's my job, right? I'm in ministry. I'm supposed to be generous, but I'm feeling so inadequate in this moment and feeling like, Lord, is this where you really called me to be? And believe me, there were so many words that I wanted to call out to, to, to just to be strong in the word. I wanted to call out, but the only thing that could mutter out of my mouth is, Lord, help. I'm so tired. That's it. That was the only, that was the strongest words that I had that could come out of my mouth. As I'm thinking about it, I'm like, Lord. How can I give a, with a generous heart when I don't even feel like I'm capable enough to control my life? Lord, how can I give from a generous heart when that gaslight is on, the tank is empty? I don't have anything else to give. How do I give from that place? In that moment, it's a realization of we need to alter our focus. The focus needs to get off the how. It's not how to get a generous heart. We don't need another how-to book. We don't need another generosity for dummies book. We don't need that. The focus now shifts to the who that gives a generous heart. It is the who that gives the generous heart because it is the who. That's the man on the middle cross. The who is the one that will love you through that brokenness, all that junk to where you feel like you're not good enough. The the who is the one that believes that you are worth saving. Every one of you that is sitting in a seat right now, that is standing up, worth saving. So just for a moment, you let that sink in. Can you really let it sink in? Because when it does, when it really sinks in, we start to see generosity. It comes from the grace of God that abounds in you. It is the overflow. It is the overflow. Now, one of the things that we probably don't like, grace normally comes through a thorn. A thorn... It's something that is uncomfortable. A thorn is maybe a storm that you're walking through. Even Jesus, he said, Lord, take this cup of suffering away from me. If it is your will, take this cup of suffering away from me. Because Jesus was being real because he knows that is what we go through. Paul, three times he asked, take this thorn out of me. Why? Because, well, remember, Paul had a little bit different situations. He's getting, he's getting rocks thrown at him. He's getting, he's getting whipped. He's getting beaten. He's getting threatened. He's getting thrown in jail. And he's probably like, man, I'm going from here. Now I'm a, I'm a believer and all these things are happening to me. Lord, what, what is the purpose of that? Three times, Lord, can you take this thorn away from me? And then God responds. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, this is Paul talking now, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Wow, this is, Different, right? Weakness normally is a bad thing. And now we have Paul that is ready to to boast in that. Thing is, when we go to Psalm 13, we all go through the same stuff. We all have these hills to climb. It doesn't matter what mask that someone may put on. Everybody has this hard hill that they are climbing called life. But there's an answer. This grace... The Lord's talking about, when he says it's sufficient, that means 
it covers everything. There's not one thing that you could say, well, Lord, will it cover? Yes, it does. There's no fine print in here. There's no conditions to his grace. This is one of the only things that we will ever encounter that is unconditional. His love and his grace for you because he died for you while we were still sinners. He didn't wait till we were perfect. He did it while we were still broken. And here's what I love about this, because you want to talk about communion? Are you, not, are you not feeling enough? Are you not feeling inadequate? Well, guess what? That's covered by the blood of Jesus. Are you feeling afraid because we have no idea what that next step in life is? I feel like I've been hit with that wave and wave uh, and time and time again. The beautiful thing, that is covered by the blood of Jesus. And when we get that, something starts to shift. It just begins to shift in our minds. And it's because of God's love. It begins to, to, to shift the way we think, the way we act. Because before Christ, I know for me, it was what can I get today? Who's going to help me today? How am I going to get happy today? And it starts to shift. It shifts into, Lord, how can you use me today to help someone? But it doesn't stop right there. How can you use me today to help someone to bring you glory? Because it is not our glory. It is not our glory. You want to know something that energizes me about this church? You want to know something that energizes me? Because when we're out there in the lobby and I'm having conversation after conversation, it is the same question that pops up time and time again. The question is, how can I do more? Come on, what a great church. What a community. What a community. And so here's my message to you that the, laid on, that the Lord laid on my heart, that that fire that you have in your belly to be part of changing someone's life, that fire to draw them near to Jesus, that is the most real thing that you're ever going to encounter in your entire life. And so we're going to break this down into two parts. I know most of you thought we were into the sermon. We're not. <laughs> we're not. <laughs> Right, we're going to break this down into two parts, and it's going to. And the two parts are: where are we, and where are we going? With generosity, where are we, and where are we going? So that first part that we're talking about, generosity is just as strong as your roots. Generosity is only as strong as your roots. If we're not looking to Jesus first. If he is not our priority, then that generosity is going to be built on dying roots. Because I hear, right, same people say, hey, uh, I see people who aren't Christian and, and they're given to the poor. Time's only going to tell what they're rooted in. Because guess what? When we're talking about generosity, when we talk about giving, there are also pitfalls that come with that. Pitfall number one is that need to be, that insatiable need to be recognized because there's something that might be hidden and you need to be recognized. The need to feel like that I need to be praised. I need people to know exactly what I'm doing so that I can be affirmed. Well, scripture says that's going to be your reward then. Your praise of people, that will be your reward. Or this hunger. I've seen this second one time and time again, this hunger to get away from trauma and past hurts. That feeling that I have this void that I need to fill, so I'm going to keep serving, 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 helping, helping, helping. It needs to fill my void. And at the end of it all, we come to, this, we, we, we come to realize there is only one that is going to completely fill that void. And so this reminds me, actually, of a piece of equipment that I don't know why they made it in the gym. It's called the treadmill, right? I don't know why they did it. Don't like it. 
right? But why does it remind me of the treadmill? Because on the treadmill, think about it. You are running, you're pouring down sweat. You're doing all this stuff and you're in the same place. The same place. But sometimes that's what we could do, right? Well, we keep serving, we keep doing. It's, all, it's what we've always done, so I'm just going to keep doing that. But yet you're in the same place without Jesus. And so there's a remedy to that. There's a remedy. The word of God is like an open book test for this life. Because when you research, okay, how do I become wealthy? How do I become happy? How do I do this? Well, you're going to get some of the same results that, that you're being told that joy and happiness, all these things that you've ever wanted, they're, only, they're up to you. They're up to you to, to get out there and get it, that you just need to rely on yourself. You need to look within. I'm pretty sure that I've let myself down way too many times to believe that. I've let myself down way too many times to believe that, but I'm so thankful that we have a God that says, no, 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 I'm not asking you to do it alone. I'm saying I want you to connect in me, with me. This life you don't have to do alone. This generosity thing you don't have to do alone. Connect in and with me. And we find proof of that in John 15, 5. When Jesus is talking, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Guys, I don't have, I don't have an, awesome, an awesome statement to really expound that because it's already great in itself because point blank it says we need Jesus to sustain because in this life, when we're apart from him, there's nothing to grasp onto, right? It's like, it's like grains of sand that's just slipping through your fingers. But yet he says, hold on to me, rest in me, be with me. And there's a place that, that me and my family, we like to go to from time to time. It's called Milburn Orchard. Has anybody been there, Cecil County, Milburn Orchard? Well, if you haven't been there, go there if you like apples, right? Anyway, so... They're known for, for growing these fresh apples. And I'm talking they're luscious. They're beautiful. They taste so good. Now, the cool thing about it is when you go there, you pluck apples off and you get to take them home. But here's what we've got to realize. As soon as we pluck that apple alone, well, time's ticking. Because once you pluck that apple, now the time is ticking that it starts to become mushy. The taste starts to fade. It starts to become bruised. And so for us, when, when you look at that analogy, for us, remaining in Christ, it reassures life. It reassures that he is in us and that we are in him. And just as I talked about, when you look up how to do certain things, you kind of get the vibe of, okay, it's up to me. It's up to me. And so when you have that mentality of it's up to me, that is a heavy burden to carry. That is a heavy burden to try to carry by yourself. And it starts to be, put the blinders on. It starts to cover your eyes. And it's hard to see God's riches that are in your life. It, you know what else it's hard to see? It's hard to see the contentment that the Lord made for you. And when it's hard to see that contentment, well, you're just running in circles because you don't know who you are. You don't know what you're rooted in. Thank God we have a God that says, don't worry about that. You need to root into me. And just like those apples on that tree, when you walk into Milburn Orchards, and it's beautiful, those apples are a sign of life in that tree. They're a sign of health in that tree. Just like a generous heart is evidence of your blossoming relationship with Jesus, it is the overflow that we see. Here's my favorite part. Generosity starts to become contagious. It starts to become contagious. And then James confirms this in James 2.26. says, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. If you have no spirit left, your body's dead. I'm pretty sure we can all agree to that. 
And so as, as faith begins to build up, as you start to look towards God instead of self, I think the question starts to become asked, why are you like this? Right? And some people might be asking that question because they want, want what you have, or they might be asking it because you look crazy. Right? That's okay. That's fine. But it just reminds me, I, I was having coffee over with a friend uh, a couple months ago. Right? And, and, and he asked me that question. He said, hey, man, you seem like you got energy all the time. He's like, why are you like this? I was like, <laughs> let me tell you about my morning routine. I want to tell you that I work out every day. I want to tell, right? I wanted to make this about me. Like, I wish I could tell you guys I had the holy answer lined up. But, man, I was about to do a little a, a puff piece. I was about to lay it down. I was going to be that online person. But thank God that he has power to, to shut people's mouth. Because to be honest, as those, those, those thoughts faded away, my eyes started to well up. And all I could say is, because of Jesus. He took away this heart of stone. This heart of stone that used to only think about me. The heart of stone that only focused on the bad things in the world. The heart of stone that didn't care about other people's feelings. And he replaced it with, with him. He replaced it with the heart of flesh. He replaced it with how can I serve? How can I help? How can I give? And let me say, because sometimes there are people that get this confused. They say, oh, I thought salvation was not by your works. Correct. We're not saved because of what we do. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross. Because when, when James says that faith without works is dead, he says this because Lack of works, it reveals an unchanged heart. Lack of works means there is no surrender. Now on the flip side, when this heart is changed, when this heart is now flesh solely because of Jesus, it creates works. Your very existence, it begins to carry this light. The way you listen, the way you smile, the way you laugh, the way you care, it starts to look like Jesus. How do we multiply this? How do we fan the flame? In Romans 12, 4 through 8, it says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, thank God. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Up to this moment, we've talked about us as individuals, of, of us becoming rooted in Christ. But the thing is, it starts with individuals and then it begins to grow. And we start to see churches that are rooted in the word. And what does this do now? It provokes people to talk. It provokes people to share their talents and what, 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 what they can do. And it, it builds this community. So what does generosity in the church look like? It looks like families not going hungry. It looks like people being loved through their afflictions, their addictions, their difficulties. It looks like local businesses ready to serve in whatever capacity that looks like. And we see a community that is changed from the inside out. And so being rooted in Jesus, it points to one specific thing. Generosity is not something you do, it's something you become. It's not something you do, it's more of who you are. And as we go into this second half, point number two is God made you for more. God made you for more. And so in Matthew 25, we see the parable of talents, right? So when we look at talents, that kind of equated to gold or, or millions of dollars. 
And so there was a master, and he was trusting his three servants. He said, I'm going to give you this. Now, based on their ability, he gave servant one five talents, servant two two talents, servant one one talent. And so he placed his wealth and his trust that they were going to bring more value by multiplying it. So we're going to read on what that looked like. What was the results of that? So in Matthew 25, 20 through 21, it says, And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you have delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. And even scripture after that talks about the second servant came in. He had two talents. He said, I, I made two talents. Now the third one, the third servant, maybe he was only given one talent, but remember, he still was trusted with a lot of money in that time, a lot of value. And so in Matthew 25, 24 through 26, there we go. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you were going to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. Oof, don't want to hear that. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Based on his actions, he was shown, it's not like I would make that much of a difference anyway. I think sometimes we get stuck in the, yeah, but what, what am I going to do? Am I really going to make a difference as one person? But we also, it's also revealed he didn't know his master's heart. He didn't know that his master, that he trusted in him to multiply what was given to him. And and there was even a time that he made excuses and started blaming the master. Man, I've made a couple excuses myself throughout the years. And I don't know about you, but my excuses did not work. And so, so many times we're falling in this category because we're holding what we have so tight because we're like, I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose it. And in that moment of I don't want to lose it, we are not trusting God with what he's given us because we got to realize that every resource and every talent that we've ever had has come from God. And so we keep these things to ourselves, and it reminds me of just this imagery to where you have two cups of water and there's someone sitting there that is dying of thirst and you walk up to them with these two cups of water and they're looking up at you saying, can I just get a sip? And as you're sitting there, you think in your mind, okay, but what if I get thirsty later? I'm going to drink this, but what if I get thirsty later? And as this person is suffering and you can help, You just walk away because you don't want to lose it. So when we read Proverbs 11.25, whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. As you pour out, the Lord is going to pour back in. Now, please do not confuse that with the prosperity gospel. I'm not going to say, hey, you need to give because God's going to give you tenfold. Is that in scripture? Yeah. But that is not the heart of why we give. The heart of why we give is because we want to spread what the kingdom has to offer. It could be something as simple as time. Because you could expose someone to eternal life. It could be something like resources and money that begin to sustain programs that are, that are serving our very community. The same type of programs that when you give to, like beyond Capernaum, has over 900 beautiful souls that get served. Because of the bold step that you're taking, not only are physical needs being met, But we're seeing hearts being changed, and now that person that you're impacting has the same eternal assurance that you have. So now I'm going to wrap this up. We're going to wrap this all up, okay? 2 Corinthians 9, 12 through 13. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgiving to God. 
by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. Generosity is not results-driven, it's God-driven. We can't go into generosity hoping to see results all the time because you may not see it. But if it's God-driven, you've got to trust that God's going to do his job. And so where in your life, where, where can your life be an overflow of God's grace? Is it that person that God laid on your heart to text today, to call today? Do it. You will not regret it. Even if they don't text you back, you won't regret it. They know that someone was praying for them. Someone was loving them. Or is it that one ministry, that one program that's bringing hope to many and many of people? Join it. We think too much instead of act. I don't know if you've realized this yet, but I, this message is supposed to be provoking. We want to see movement in the body so we can see movement out there. So I want to leave you with one quick story that opened my eyes. There's going to be a photo that, that pops up here in a second. Hopefully. Even if it doesn't. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, here we are. We're, we're under a bus stop. And uh, a couple years ago, we were handing out stockings in the city of Baltimore. Right, we're handing out stockings. That's me and my dad. Um, Andy was a part of it. We're handing out stockings. Right, and... and, and we go up there, and remember, we're going to leave. We're going to get into a, a, a nice heated car, and we're going to go home. These guys right here, this is their home. And so we give these stockings. Man, they're excited, right? And they say, hey, do you mind if I pray for you? And they're like, absolutely, go ahead. Right? So we do a prayer. We uh, say amen. Say, we wish you guys well. We start walking away. He goes, young man, come here. So Okay. He said, can I pray for you? Guys, I was dumbfounded. Because in my mind, the thoughts are running. What do you mean? You don't have anything. And you want to pray for me? He said, can I pray for you? Doesn't matter if I don't have anything. The kingdom is the only thing that matters. And so here's the question that I want to leave you with. Right, as we're wrapping up, here's the question I want to leave you with. Will your legacy point towards Jesus? We always say we want to leave our mark. Well, here's my question. Will your legacy, will your life's work, will it point to Jesus? Because in the end, we all want to hear these beautiful words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. So in a moment, we're about to open up that baptism pool. Nobody's forcing you. This is between you and God. If you're feeling led to turn away from the sins, to turn away from your old way of thinking and become renewed and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, take the time to go there. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the words that you give. Lord, thank you for the gospel that is so powerful, that is on the tip of our tongues, that is accessible to us 24-7. Lord, let your glory continue to move us towards action to your kingdom so it's not for our gain, but it is for your gain. It's for heaven's gain. Father, I pray that as you are provoking people today, Lord, let them take that first step, that minor, that little step that above all glorifies you. In your holy name, amen. Andrew, thank you for that word. We are grateful for you. As we go to worship the Lord and prepare here, for these baptisms and to witness being buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. We're entering a season where we will have messages on the names of God for Advent and Christmas. 
Let's pour out our hearts generously to him with gratefulness. Let's stand to our feet.
You are so, so generous to us, and we are so, so thankful. You are generous to us in the waters of baptism, and we rejoice in new life. You are so generous to us in simple prayers of blessing. And so we, as the Israel of God, we conclude our time together with the blessing that Moses gave Aaron to pray over the people again and again. Yevarechecha Adonai Veishmalecha Yaher Adonai Panavelecha Vikonecha Yis Adonai Sim lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and be gracious to you and give you his peace. Amen. Have a wonderful week.